This talk uh, that I'm going to give is on the myths of uh, market failure. And uh, to give you a little perspective, uh, you know, in the course of my career, I, I used to publish quite a bit in the area of antitrust and industrial organization. And, uh, and one of the things I've, I published in an article a long time ago in a, a journal called Economic Inquiry uh, was about the origins of, of antitrust uh, and, and what economists were thinking about antitrust regulation at the time the first antitrust law was passed, the Sherman Antitrust Law in the United States in 1890, the year 1890. And, uh, and one of the things I found was that the, uh, the uh, American economics profession was almost unanimously opposed in principle to the whole idea of antitrust regulation. They thought, they thought it was inherently incompatible with the whole idea of competition. And the reason was they, they thought of competition like the Austrians do as a dynamic, rivalrous discovery process that involves entrepreneurship. It's ongoing, never ending. And they saw what was happening in their economic world at the time. Uh, with There was a merger wave in the late eight, 1880s in the United States. And, but they saw prices falling, uh, output expanding. They, uh, they saw new products, hundreds of new products being created. Uh, there was deflation for uh, 35 years after the American Civil War. And they thought it was all, all good. It was all this competition. So that they didn't see the, uh, the merger wave of the time as, as a bad thing. That, but, and that, that pretty much was the thinking until uh, you get to around the 1920s and 30s. And the, the theory of competition changed. And the theory of competition that was held by uh, those who called themselves professional economists became the, the theory of perfect competition. I don't know, maybe Peter Klein uh, covered some of this in the last lecture, in the last class. But all of a sudden, uh, the thinking of competition went from uh, dynamic, rivalrous entrepreneurship, the way Adam Smith saw it, the way the Austrians have always seen it, to this, this weird theory that says competition means many firms producing homogeneous products, homogeneous prices, costless entry and exit, and perfect information. And as Friedrich Hayek wrote in a, in a famous article of his called The Meaning of Competition, in, in perfect competition, there is no competition. It's all assumed away. And so, and so if you look at, if you define competition in that way, that led to a whole, a huge industry uh, uh, in the economics profession of market failure theory. And the 1950s was probably the, uh, the high point of the market failure theorizing, where there was market failure everywhere, because after all, nothing on earth is perfect. And so if you posit that uh, this is what perfection is, uh, and then you compare the real world to that, uh, I, I sometimes call it this. <laughs> you, you, you compare the real world to this bizarre model of utopia, and you say, aha, the market has failed. And so there were hundreds, probably thousands of articles written by, uh, by economists uh, you know, labeling anything that happened in the market as, as a failure because it failed to reach this. And uh, it got to the point of, of absurdity. Even by the, by the 1970s, uh, the late Robert Bork, who, who taught antitrust law at Yale for, I think, 17 years or something like that, he wrote a book uh, called The Antitrust Paradox, and, uh, and the there's a funny line in there. My, my favorite line in the whole book is that he said, if, if, we act, if the government actually tried to enforce perfect competition on the U.S. economy, it would have the same effect on wealth as several strategically placed nuclear explosions. <laughs> and, and he wasn't an Austrian. And, you know, I never thought of him as an Austrian economist. But, but he was a Chicago school uh, uh, law and economics guy. So he, he knew a bit about economics. And, and he wrote some pretty good things uh, about, about that subject. And so, and so you had this whole list of uh, market failures based on basically what, I, uh, what the, the economist Harold Demsetz called the Nirvana fallacy. And th this was in an article that Harold Demsetz, I'll write, I'll write his name down here, for those of you who have never heard of Demsetz. He was a UCLA professor. which I always thought he was very close to being an Austrian, although he never called himself an Austrian. But his, his, the way he wrote about markets was very consistent with 
with things that you'd expect to see from Peter Klein, for example, with the emphasis on entrepreneurship and the dynamic market. Uh, and, and so he was, I always thought of him as a fellow traveler of the Austrians. But he coined this uh, phrase in an article in the Journal of Law and Economics, I think it was 1969, 1970. Uh, it, it was called Information and Efficiency. Uh, I think it was called Two Viewpoints. And so that's the Nirvana fallacy. And so what I have here in this list is four reasons why I think there are there are a lot of myths about market failure. And then I'm going to talk about some specific myths that, that I that I think have been debunked either by me or, or, or others. And the first one is the Nirvana fallacy, you know, comparing the real world to utopia. Uh, the real world always falls short. The second is the ignoring of entrepreneurship. A lot of the market failure stories are externality stories, for example, and uh, and they just condemn the market for not being perfect in some way because they are the presence of externality problems. But human beings are problem solvers, at least some of us are, and especially when there's money involved. If there's money to be made, someone is going to figure out how to make that money. And, and a lot of times, the so-called external, externality problems are just that. There's a, a they are solved by just that means. By there's a way of making money in it, and somebody does and solves the problem in uh, in doing it. Uh, some of our friends in Montana that uh, run the uh, Political Economy Research Center. Uh, uh, study what they call envirepreneurship, uh, for example. And I just sent them an article from my local paper. I live in South Florida, and there's a, a brewery near my house, Saltwater Brewery. I noticed they sell the beer next door, Saltwater Brewery beer right next door. But these guys, I think they're going to make a lot more money by solving an environmental problem than they are selling beer. They're successful selling beer because they're they just op- they just rented out a barn in Delray Beach, Florida, and now I see their beer on tap at um, uh, Mama Goldberg's. So they're they're going national and international, but they're environmentalists, and they figured out uh, how, uh, you know, there's a problem. If you live on the coast, you see these stories of fish uh, choking to death on uh, six pack rings, plastic six pack rings. They got the residue from brewing the beer, and they hired a chemist. And they figured out how to make six-pack rings that are uh, that are degradable, so that they're good enough to hold six packs of beer or Pepsi or whatever. But uh, they throw them into a fish tank, and the fish eat them. The fish eat they eat the six-pack rings. And the, our, the local paper said they just had an order from like Anheuser Busch for fifty thousand of these things. And so uh, and that's the first order. So and I don't know how much money they're going to make, but if you sell fifty thousand of anything. That's a good piece of change, and so, and so, and so, and they they didn't. There was money in it. You know, they didn't do it necessarily uh, solely because they love uh, fish or they felt felt sorry for fish choking to death. Uh, they're becoming very rich doing that. So that's the second reason. Third reason is lazy economists who uh, who spend their time never getting up out of their swivel chair in their faculty office and theorizing all day long without ever looking out the window to see if the world matches their theories. And then the fourth reason for this that I would give is uh, it diverts attention to problems that are actually caused by government. A lot of problems, monopoly and so forth, that have historically been caused by government, all of a sudden they, they divert attention and say, no, no, it's the market that causes all these problems. So those are four reasons. So, so what are some examples that I want to talk about? The first one is antitrust, which I mentioned briefly uh, earlier. And uh, I once did a survey of, of all the... All the when I was at George Mason University a hundred years ago, I, I, I got uh, all the books from the library. I had a research assistant that uh, about antitrust law or antitrust economics, and uh, I want to know well, well, what are they saying about the origin of antitrust? Because the, by that time, the Chicago School mostly and some of the Austrians had decades of criticism of antitrust in practice, but all the books seemed to say, but there was a golden age in eight, the eighteen eighties where antitrust was needed. We, we may have had a hundred years of counterproductive policy that actually makes markets less competitive, but it was good at the beginning. And, and I wasn't really buying that story. And so, uh, and so, and sure enough, all the books said, yeah, there was a golden age. There was rampant cartelization, rampant mon- monopolization, and government came to the rescue and, 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 uh, and uh, established the Sherman antitrust law. Okay, and so uh, and that's the standard story that's still in a lot, in a lot of the books, and uh, and so what I did was uh, I I tried to look for the data 
uh, they would back this up and found there was none. None, none of the books had any, uh, not one statistic about any of it. So um, my research assistant and I uh, dug it up, didn't you know, went to the Library of Congress. We, we got all uh, what data, statistical, uh, uh, the statistics of the United States from the Census Bureau. And, uh, and one of the things we found, I'll give you just very briefly what I found. I published this article in the International Review of Law and Economics way back, I think 1984, I think is when it was. But uh, 10 years prior to the Sherman Act being passed, passed in 1890, uh, GDP was growing at 24%. For that 10 year period, uh, GDP, according to the government's own statistics, 24%. The average growth, the average growth rate of industries that were accused of being monopolies by the US Congress at the, during that time grew at 175% on average. That's what is that seven times faster? So the so the the industries that were accused of monopolizing industry were growing seven times faster than the economy as a whole, and the economy as a whole was was doing well. It's a period of deflation. The government's uh, CPI fell by seven percent during that decade, but the, but these these uh, industries that were expanding their production seven times faster than GDP were cutting prices even further. The steel rails, for example, fell by 53%. That was kind of pretty common during, during that time. And so what I found was that the, these, these industries that were targeted as monopolies and even involved matches and castor oil that they were complaining about were the fastest growing, uh, fiercest price cutting, most innovating industries uh, of all. So there was no monopoly. There was no monopoly. The old economists had it right. In, in my article in Economic Inquiry, when I when I when I followed up from this article to the, the Economic Inquiry article was published four years later, was that the economists of the of the day got it right. There was nothing to worry about here. Uh, even even socialists like uh, like Richard T. Ely, uh, uh, with, uh, the big statist, even he was against the antitrust law at the time. And so that, that's the first big example I would offer of a, a myth of market failure, uh, you know, one of the biggest ones. The second big myth is the natural monopoly. And, uh, and, I, and I wrote an article years ago in the Review of Austrian Economics about called the myth of natural monopoly. It's online. You can Google that and find it. And I was always suspicious of this story also, that you know, the story is still told today in the textbooks is that in the industries with the heavy fixed cost, uh, you know, and you know what industries don't have heavy fixed costs these days. To, you know, before you uh, before you get started, uh, we'll have economies of scale. You know, once it, it costs a lot of money to build a power plant, but then once you start hooking up individual customers, you know, your your costs are mostly fixed, and then you you add uh, you know customer after customer, and and so the cost per unit falls sharply. And the sto basic story is that in industries like that, with economies of scale. Uh, that uh, there's one big one big company will will have will achieve economies of scale first, basically, and be able to underprice everybody and become a monopoly. Now, we don't want that. We don't want a monopoly. Uh, but there could be a silver lining in the story. The story goes is that on the other hand, if the government creates a monopoly on purpose, then we can have the advantage of the lower cost for electricity and all these things. But then the government will regulate the price in the public interest so that we won't have a monopoly price. We'll have a competitive price. That's the theory of natural monopoly. And, and so, you know, one thing I, so I dug into this too, as had other people, and, uh, and found out that, well, this, this was the theory, but it never happened in the, in the United States. This, uh, it never happened that a natural monopoly evolved in the free market, and, the, and then the government came to the rescue with some bureaucrat riding in on a white horse uh, to, to, to rescue the, the consumers. When, when I had friends working at the Federal Trade Commission, by the way, there's a statue in front of the Federal Trade Commission of a, 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 a big cement horse and a, a big strong man, like, you know, like a professional wrestler wrestling the horse. And I asked my friend Bruce Yandel uh, years ago, who was working there, well, what's, what's this about? What is the horse and the guy? And he told me the horse was runaway government and the man was an economist that was trying to wrestle it down. <laughs> but, 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 but actually, I think the real meaning of it is the, the horse, the, the wild horse is capitalism and the, the big strong he-man was the government. It was taming, taming capitalism. It's, it's just, to this day, it's still, still there. But again, there, there's a Harold Dempsey. This is why I, I, kinda, I, was, I, I was a 
I wasn't a student of his, but I liked his writings back, back in the day when I was researching this. He wrote in his book, Efficiency, Competition, and Public Policy, he did a survey of what was going on in the, these industries, the, uh, the natural monopolies at the time, late, 18, late 19th century, early 20th century. He said this, six electric light companies were organized in one year of 1887 uh, in New York City. 45 electric light uh, enterprises had a legal right to operate in Chicago in 1907. Prior to 1895, Duluth, Minnesota had five electric light companies. During the latter part of the 19th century, competition was the usual situation in the gas industry in this country. Before 1884, six competing companies were operating in New York City. Competition was common and especially persistent in the telephone industry and on and on and on. So there was fierce competition in all these so-called natural monopolies. And so, and I wrote about this in my article and uh, I used to be a library rat. before When, when I was uh, early in my career, before the Internet, uh, I was a library rat. That's how I got to write articles and books that are sort of investigative. Like, I enjoyed just going through libraries. David Gordon is probably like this, too. But, uh, but uh, and I, the, the Johns Hopkins Library was about a 15-minute walk from my office at Loyola in Baltimore. And one day I'm in the Johns Hopkins Library, and I'm looking and all this literature, because I knew Richard T. Ely taught at Johns Hopkins. So I went there to see uh, what what kind of collection of his writings they had. And I was digging around, and I found uh, Ely, and he had written a lot on this subject uh, at the time, you know, early 20th century. And I found an old book on the history of the Baltimore Gas Light Company that Richard T. Ely wrote about. And it was it, it, it tells about the origins of natural monopoly in America, of how it got started. And it, one of the first states to start it was Maryland, was, was Baltimore, Maryland. And here's, here's, uh, here's what this book says, how, uh, how it came into being. In 1890, a bill was introduced into the Maryland legislature that called for an annual payment to the city from the Consolidated Gas Company of $10,000 a year and 3% of all dividends declared in return for the privilege of enjoying a 25-year monopoly. So before that, there was competition, and they sometimes tried to form cartels, but cartels always break down, didn't work. So they run to the government and said, listen, this is how we should do this. Give us a 25-year monopoly, and we will share the loot with you, politicians. <laughs> You know, what it was it, uh, $10,000? Uh, you know, in that, that period of time, that, that was a lot of money. $10,000 a year and 3% of all dividends uh, for a 25 year uh, uh, monopoly. And another old uh, economist I ran uh, across uh, in a journal, Journal of Land and Public Utility uh, Economics, points out that, you know, the whole National Recovery Act was basically like this when, when Roosevelt. Uh, uh, set, about, set about to to monopolize all manufacturing industry. This was basically the model. Government created monopolies with price fixing police roaming the, the streets, enforcing the price codes. That was basically how how those monopolies were all created. And uh, in this one other article that I ran across by an economist named Horace Gray, uh, he says this. Uh, he says, uh, you know, before too long, you know, once they started this with the, the, the gas companies and the electric companies, he says, uh, everybody, everybody declared, I'm a natural monopoly too. <laughs> and this included uh, the radio, real estate, milk, airline, coal, oil, and agricultural industries, to name a few. Everybody, you know, don't forget me, I'm natural, I'm as natural as the other guy. And so... And so, so that's, that's, that's the reality of uh, so-called natural monopoly. It was created by government. But this whole elaborate theory was, was, uh, was a big diversion away from the fact that government uh, created it. You know, in the common law, the English common law, which, much of which was adopted by, by Americans, uh, monopoly was always defined as a grant by the state. It wasn't until the early 20th century that monopoly was associated with the market. And, uh, and I think the, the, the creation of the perfect competition theory had a lot to do with that. But it was always assumed before that that monopoly was a grant by the king or, the, or by the parliament or, or by somebody. Okay. Um, I have a whole list of uh, these uh, fallacies. And I'm, going to talk, I'm going to talk about as many of them as I can, I guess, uh, during the time that I have. The next one is the fable of the bees. This is a... And, uh, this is associated with an economist named Stephen Chung. Uh, 
if you Google Stephen Chung, Fable of the Bees, you find his famous article. And, uh, and it was famous because in, in, all, in all the economics textbooks in the 1950s and 60s, 70s, they, they quoted an economist named J.E. Mead. And, and, uh, and when you get to the section on externality problems, uh, externality, negative externality problems, and positive externality problems. And the example he gave, and this ended up in all the textbooks for a long time, was a situation where you had beekeepers near an apple orchard. And you know the bees pollinate the apple orchard, and as a result, the apple, the apple grower has more apples because his apples are pollinated. And this is a market failure, according to J.E. Mead, because there would be no mechanism for, for the farmer or the apple, the apple grower to pay the beekeeper. Uh, and so there's a, an, an unpaid uh, resource there, a positive externality. And at the same time, it's reciprocal because the, the apple trees, the blossoms on the apple trees provide food for the bees. But the, he said there's no mechanism, though, uh, where the, uh, the, there could be any kind of collaboration between the beekeepers who have bees and the, and the apple orchard owner. Uh, and, and so there's the, these obvious benefits there. So he called for government subsidies of beekeepers. He said, to, to correct this market failure, the government should start, start subsidizing beekeepers. Now, I, I always assumed that J.E. Mead must have been a beekeeper on the side. Uh, 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 you know, in addition to being a professor at MIT, you know, he had a beehives in his backyard or something like that. But uh, anyway, Stephen Chung, he's, he's, a, he's a professor at the University of Washington. You know, if you went to the grocery store this afternoon to buy apples, Half of them in the, in the apple bin would probably be from Washington State, a big apple growing state. And so he did something almost unheard of among academic economists. He got up off his butt and left his office. <laughs> and he decided to investigate and actually educate himself about the beekeeping and apple growing industries. And he was curious about this. He was in all the books, all the textbooks. And sure enough, what he found was that for generations, they had implicit and explicit contracts between the beekeepers and the and the uh, the apple orchard owners, and they were very explicit, very detailed. Uh, for example, they, they even had things that would say, uh, uh, if uh, it we're contractually obligated, if we're going to spray bug killing poison on our apple trees, we have to give the beekeepers two weeks' notice so that they get the hives out of there, and we don't want to kill off the bees with the, the poison that we put on to kill the other bugs on the trees and things like that. And they pay, and they had payments. They had payments going in both directions depending on the, the situation, what kind of uh, apple orchard or what kind of fruit orchard you had and, and the bees. And so, uh, so basically what he found was that for many generations, these business people were not as stupid as economists assumed all entrepreneurs are. There was money to be made by collaborating between the beekeepers and the, and the apple orchard owners. And, there, and sure enough, uh, if there's money to be made, somebody will figure out how to make it. And so, so again, by, by ignoring the whole process of entrepreneurship, economists tend to not even think about private solutions to, to problems like this. They just assume that it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's never ending, and there'd be no, there'd be no end to it. Uh, the next example is QWERTY. Anybody, who knows what QWERTY is? You know, it's, it's the keyboard, it's the keyboard on a, on a computer. This is the configuration of the keys on a, on a computer. Uh, well, the next, uh, uh, type of market failure has to do with what uh, a, a buzzword that's used for it is path dependence. And uh, the idea is that sometimes in a free market, there will be an inferior technology that will be locked in. The people will, will use this technology, and there might be better, more efficient technologies out there, but uh, you know, once people adopt it, uh, the market tends to lock it in and so, so the whole society becomes less efficient with inferior technology. And uh, there was an economist named Paul David uh, wrote several articles on this uh, quite a few years ago. And, uh, and he used the QWERTY as an example, as a prime example in, uh, in a couple of his articles. Uh, because there was another keyboard configuration called the Dvorak. I gave this talk at the... Uh, in uh, Prague once. Uh, I was invited to give lectures for 10 days at the Prague University of Economics, and, uh, and uh, the students all laughed when I mentioned Dvorak. He was a Czech, but he was, he was an American, but he was of Czech descent. I don't know why they laughed. They thought it was funny that there's someone from Czech Republic would be in America, so, uh, but they thought that was a funny thing. 
But, he's, but anyway, Dvorak, it, it, it was a different configuration of the keys. And, and, and Mr. Dvorak claimed that uh, his configuration was superior. And then this was way back in the 1940s, he was claiming this. And then Paul David, the economist in the 70s and 80s, is writing these articles saying, well, yeah, the, the Dvorak configuration, there's evidence that it was uh, superior to the QWERTY. Although by then the QWERTY was just a, a sort of, uh, uh, by circumstance, happenstance, locked in, and the market fails us yet again. And so anyway, um, uh, two economists, uh, uh, Leibowitz and Margolis, Stan Leibowitz and Eric Margolis, looked into this, sort of like, and they did apparently what uh, Stephen Chung did, uh, the, the just unspeakable act of getting off off their butts and leaving their faculty offices and, and investigating the whole computer keyboard industry and becoming sort of experts in, in the whole thing. And among the things they found was that the evidence of the superiority of the Dvorak keyboard uh, was produced by a naval officer during World War II named Dvorak, and, uh, and, he, and who had a patent on that keyboard, and it was his secretary who did the testing, and, and, and claimed that uh, you know basically uh, his keyboard was superior. And so so they did. You know, Leibowitz and Margolis did. They, I think they hired. They, Somebody to do, you know, they did additional tests of the, the of the things, and they found they got pretty similar. There was no out, there was no extreme difference in in in, uh, in one over the other, according to what they said. But uh, the thing is, uh, uh, it wasn't worth it to the consumer to switch. You know, they had an opportunity to switch, just like you can switch from Apple to uh, to word uh, processing on your uh, on your writing and your computers. But you know, once you learn one system, it's just not worth it to a lot of people. Now, if there's a big significant improvement, it might be worth it to retrain yourself. But but in this case, there apparently wasn't. And so so uh, like the fable of the bees, the fatal of uh, QWERTY turned out to be a dud uh, as well. And I argue in uh, in one of my articles that I published that that uh, this also has everything exactly ass backwards, because if when you think about it where we really have locked in inferior technology is government. That's where the inferior technology is. Like, here's just one le recent headline that uh, was in the news recently. The U.S. nuclear arsenal is controlled by 1970s computers with 8-inch floppy disks. Uh, I, I'm old enough to have used floppy disks. On, uh, I bought my first IBM PC in 1983, but they weren't eight-inch floppy disks. They were they were four-inch. They, they were not you know eight-inch floppy disks. And so talk about uh, path dependence and locking in inferior technology. And uh, and I'm working a paper on this. If you just uh, you know this is a note I wrote to myself. It says Google quote outdated government technology. I did that just before I left to come here. And there's a big long list of articles like this uh, you know, on on the web. And so that's, that's where the outdated technology comes from. Uh, the next example I'll give is uh, the asymmetric information prob problem. And uh, I guess the, the, one of the pioneering articles of this was uh, uh, written by Mr. Janet Yellen. <laughs> yeah, Janet Yellen's husband. You know who Janet Yellen is, the chairman of the Fed, or chairwoman of, of the Fed. Uh, her husband is George Akerlof, Harvard professor, and and he wrote uh, an article on uh, what is known as the lemons problem in economics in 1970 in the American Economic Review, and the story that's told is, for example, a, a, a used car dealer has more information about the quality of the used car than the buyer, than you, the customer. Uh, therefore, uh, he's able to rip you off and you know, sell you a lemon. And he predicted that the whole used car market would disappear because of this. It'd be such a severe market failure that the whole car market, would, used car market, would just be non-existent. This is 1970, and there were already warranties on used cars in 1970. So, like, uh, and, and of course now and nowadays, if you buy a car from CarMax today, it's a big uh, used car place in the U.S. I think they still give you uh, five days to take it back, no questions answered if you decide you don't like the car, and 30-day warranties, you can buy inexpensive extended warranties. So that pretty much solved the problem. So the problem of asymmetric information that uh, that he complained about was already solved at the time uh, by product warranties, at the time he wrote the article. But nevertheless, 
uh, there's a huge literature. Uh, you know, jo Joe Stiglitz has written um, you know hundreds of articles, I think, about this because it's an easy Nirvana fallacy thing to do. It's it's easy to posit that uh, uh, well, gee, I, the purchaser of an automobile, don't know nearly as much as an automotive engineer who works for General Motors about the workings of an automobile, don't I? And uh, I, as a consumer of steak, don't know nearly as much as a rancher who raises cattle and puts, brings the steak to market and all this stuff. You know, yeah, that's true. That's true. So, so, so this is seen as one big uh, 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 market failure problem. And I, but I published an article, a short article about this in a, the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics in uh, 2011. And uh, I'll just give you a, a couple of uh, things that I, that I wrote here. I quoted uh, Hayek. I basically argue that asymmetric information is why markets exist. It's, uh, another word for it would be the division of labor, or the division of labor and knowledge. You know, we I have I I teach economics. I make money teaching economics and writing books and things like that. And I use that to buy the things that I buy: my house, my food, and and so forth. And so that's that's what makes civilization exist, that the international division of labor and knowledge. We all have specialized knowledge in something in our work lives, and we make money doing that, and we rely on other people to provide us with our other goods. And so, and, but uh, it's really the same thing as what they're saying is asymmetric information. There wouldn't be markets without asymmetric information. Here's what Hayek said in 1964. We need to remember only how much we have to learn in any occupation after we have completed our theoretical training, <clears throat> how big a part of our working life we spend learning particular jobs, and how valuable an asset in all walks of life is knowledge of people, of local conditions, and of special circumstances. The shipper who earns his living from using otherwise empty or half-filled journeys of tramp steamers or the estate agent whose whole knowledge is almost exclusively one of temporary opportunities, or the arbitrageur who gains from local differences of commodity prices, are all performing eminently useful functions based on special knowledge of circumstances of the fleeting moment not known to others. Asymmetric information. He's saying that's what makes the market work, uh, that we all have different knowledge. And so, and I ask in my article, uh, you know, ask yourself these questions. Who knows more about home building, home builders or home buyers? Who knows more about supplying grocery stores with fresh meat, ranchers and farmers or consumers? Who knows more about manufacturing automobiles, automobile engineers or car purchasers? It's you know, the whole uh, marketplace is based on asymmetric information. I also quote Mises, uh, who, who I didn't use the words asymmetric information, but he he wrote about the uh, the topic, and I'll quote very briefly this. It says, in an economic system in which every actor is in a position to recognize correctly the market situation with the same degree of insight, the adjustment of prices to every change in the data would be achieved at one stroke. Perfect information, you know, non-asymmetric information, in other words. It is impossible to imagine such uniformity in the correct cognition and appraisal of changes in data, except by the intercession, intercession of superhuman agencies. So only, only God could create a situation where there is non-asymmetric or symmetric information, okay? We would have to assume that every man is approached by an angel informing him of the change in data, Mises wrote. And he says, uh, if, if market participants did possess the same data and information, they are bound to appraise it differently, even if you did have the same information. That's, that's, after all, that's why, uh, that's why markets work. Uh, you and I could have the exact same information about my bag here, but uh, if you are in need of a new bag and I decide uh, I'm too old to be wearing a knapsack anymore <laughs> and I should sell it to a student, we look at the exact same physical object, we have the exact same information, but we, we trade. I get rid of it, you buy it, uh, if, we can, if we can agree on a price. That's, how, that's why markets exist. And so I make the case, uh, once again, that, uh, that this is also ass backwards, to use the scientific language uh, for, for this. And I also make the case that the real asymmetric information problem is in government. Uh, just look at foreign policy, for example. You know, who, who has more information about uh, uh, the next war we're about to jump into uh, 
the the dozen or two people who start the war or you and me you know who has who has more information about that or about anything government does you know well, government secrets okay <clears throat> and so so that's asymmetric information now the free rider problem is also uh, you know greatly exaggerated i think uh, the way it's taught by most economists, though, and in the most textbooks, that students tend to get the impression that this is some sort of ironclad, uh, un insurmountable problem of markets, the free rider problem, whenever there's something of the form of a public good. And uh, one good example, one example that I'll give you of, of something that I've uh, written about is, you know, as, as a lot of you know, if you've read it, some of you have read some of my books, I'm interested in economic history. And, uh, and one of the things I wrote about in a couple of my books is the, the, the debates uh, that began with Jefferson and Hamilton and went through the Civil War, so-called, about uh, internal improvements or government subsidies for railroads, roads, canals, things like that, public works, so-called. And even beginning with Alexander Hamilton in the U.S., he articulated the free rider problem. He said private markets would never finance in sufficient amounts, uh, road building, canal building. Therefore, we need, we need government, uh, government spending to do this. And pre American president after American president vetoed all of that until Lincoln came along. It was, it was all, that's when it all, was all put in place. But, uh, but they all vetoed uh, 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 Madison, the, uh, the father of the Constitution, his very last day as president. Uh, vetoed a, a a bill that was uh, about uh, it was about giving a bonus bill to veterans. I, I believe it was, and uh, and in there someone had snuck uh, some money for road building, and and the father of the U.S. Constitution said, I, uh, to paraphrase him, I can't put my finger on the part of the Constitution that allows us to spend money on on that something like that. And other presidents said said something similar, but uh, I quote an article. On this topic of government subsidies for road building because of the free rider problem, Dan Klein, an economist Dan Klein, wrote an article in the Economic Inquiry some years ago about early American road building. And here's what he says. The private road building movement built new roads at rates previously unheard of in America. Over $11 million was invested in turnpikes in New York. He's talking about the period 1800, 1801, 1802. Hamilton was still alive. Uh, some 6.5 million in New England, over 4.5 million in Pennsylvania. Between 1794 and 1840, 238 private New England turnpike companies built and operated about 3,750 3, miles of road. New York led all other states in turnpike mileage with over 4,000 miles as of 1821. So, so even when this debate was started by Hamilton, uh, Private road building companies were busy building all the roads and canals with private funding, private investors. How did they do this? Well, yeah, there was a free rider problem, but and at the time you could you could maybe make ten percent on an investment somewhere, but only three percent if you invested in one of these turnpike companies or four percent. But people also realized that if their little town was connected to the next town over, it could it could double the size of the market for their goods that they wanted to sell. And vice versa, they would have more competition coming in to sell them things, uh, maybe at lower prices. And so the people did that, and they used social ostracism to to get their neighbors to invest and cooperate in, in this back in, in early America. Uh, it, and so uh, and so they didn't they didn't use uh, uh, the barrel of a gun, which is the governmental method, you know, pay up or die, or 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 pay up or we will make you live in a cage for for seven years, something like that. The final. Uh, Final example I'll give uh, of uh, uh, market failure mythology has to do with pollution. And uh, I wrote a couple of articles years ago. It was very interesting when, when, when uh, socialism collapsed around the world in the late 80s and early 90s. There were all these closed societies that were all of a sudden people could, from the West could go into East Germany and, and, and Poland and these places that had been part of the Soviet Union. And and people did. The you know, journalists, the United Nations sent people, the academics of all sorts could, could walk around and look around for the first time in decades. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things I was thinking about at that time was that, well, well how's, how is this going to affect the theory of negative externalities? Because after all, the theory of negative externalities that was first uh, uh, articulated by Arthur C. Pigou, the, the British economist, was that because of an unregulated markets, the pursuit of profit, 
uh, will lead uh, businesses to only consider the private costs and not the external costs like pollution of their factories. Uh, therefore, the government needs to come in and regulate in the public interest or, ta or tax in the public interest corporations that are polluting. So the root cause of pollution is the, the, uh, the pursuit of profit in unregulated markets. Well, here we have a, a natural experiment we had where, where the pursuit of profits in unregulated markets was outlawed for 40, 50, 70 years in, in all these countries. So what would you expect the environment to look like in these places? Pristine, you know, heaven on earth, you know, you look like Al Gore's backyard, something, you know, something like that. You know. And of course, the exact opposite was true. It was, there was an environmental hellhole. There were books written with titles like Ecocide and the USSR. And I gathered all this up. I wrote a bunch of articles at the time about this. And there's, there's stories of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the Russians almost uh, depleted the ca caviar by, by the sturgeon population, pretty much disappeared in Russia. Uh, there, and the, the Volga River in Russia had signs of a steamboat going down. The Volga River had signs on it, do not throw cigarettes overboard. The river may catch on fire because there's so many chemicals in, in, the, in the river. There were... 70 years of untreated sewage pumped into, into uh, uh, the Aral Sea and other big bodies of water in, uh, in Russia. And uh, the, you know, one memorable thing is they, they found an island of alkaline sewage three miles wide and eight miles long floating around in the, in the, uh, in the Aral Sea. And you can imagine being on a nice sunny day like this out on your sailboat and you fall asleep after a couple of beers and you wake up with a big thud you know, you crash into something and it's an eight mile long chunk of sewage. That, that's the sort of, there were in Poland, uh, the air pollution was so bad in Poland that they had water cannons going through downtown uh, Krakow and Warsaw several times a day to knock the lead and cadmium dust out of the air in Poland. And if you had lung disease in Poland, uh, they had underground uh, clinics in uranium mines and underground uranium mines. That's, that's where they sent you in Poland if you had uh, had lung disease from all this. And so, so you know, we've had our problems here. But but when, if you read about what happened in the in the countries that outlawed markets altogether, uh, the environmental problems were many orders of magnitude worse. And so, uh, and so the conclusion is that uh, once again, you know, there there has to be something more to it in terms of the sources of pollution than just uh, corporate greed, uh, you know, the pursuit of profit. Because after all, if you have a system of property rights that punishes people from harming others, whether through pollution or any other means, uh, that can be a deterrent, can it, if, uh, in private property and the liability that goes along with private property. They had none of that in the socialist world. And so it was one big commons and, uh, and they despoiled the commons. Uh, uh, in Czech, Czechoslovakia, one, one anecdote I remember, uh, dec <clears throat> decades of uh, chemical fertilizer had made the, the soil toxic down to a foot deep where nothing would grow. And, uh, and that, but American capitalists came to the rescue. They actually have soil cleansing machines that they went and used the soil cleansing machines to, to restore their, their farmland to uh, viability. In the, you know, after the, the collapse of communism. Okay, so those are my stories, and I'm sticking to it for, about the myths of market failure. There are many more myths of market failure, and for those of you who are looking for uh, dissertation topics or just paper topics, it's it's you know, the sky's the limit as far as that goes because there are so many so many of these theories out there. And uh, I guess our time is about up. And uh, I'm going to stick around for office hours. Thank you for uh, not falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs>